Okay, hey everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Hamid Zawani and today I'm happy to host Laura Dietz from the University of New Hampshire with us today. Um, Laura uh, is an assistant professor at the University of New Hampshire where she leads the lab for text retrieval, extraction, machine learning and analytics. So a lot of uh, aspects of uh, text analytics and retrieval and she organizes a lot of workshops and tutorials on topics related to knowledge graphs and entities. Uh, for example, utilizing knowledge graphs and text-centric retrieval or KG for IR. It's been happening multiple years, multiple iterations in several conferences. And she also organizes the track complex retrieval, uh, complex answer retrieval track. Uh, she's a recipient of the an NSF Career Award for utilizing fine grained knowledge at annotation in text understanding and retrieval. And before joining University of New Hampshire, she was a research scientist in the Data and Web Science Group at Manheim University and also the CIR at UMass, where she was a postdoc here with us. And she obtained her doctoral degree with a thesis on topic models for network data from Max Planck Institute. For informatics. So, without further ado, I'd like to ask Laura to start the, uh, her presentation on retrieve and generate how to automatically create relevant articles. Thank you, Hamid. Um, I have to admit the title was a little bit clickbaity, in that it's not the uh, it's not the um, it. Well, the whole point is the the whole um, the idea is. It, uh, I haven't really reached the goal yet. I've been working on it for probably the last uh, seven years from this idea of wanting to find a bigger set of relevant information. And we're kind of like inching there. Uh, we haven't quite reached it yet. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is where we, how far we have made it on that track, uh, what things are missing. And if you have interest in like a collaboration, just like reach out to me. Um, one of the things that kind of like always bothered me is in web search is how, how bad it works in some situations. And I think like most users are very well trained to not ask certain kind of questions because the results that they will get are like not really satisfying. Um, it works well for navigational queries or for like refining to some extent. Uh, but if you're asking for like bigger topics where you don't know enough to really ask a concrete question, you just want to know everything that is relevant you have to like manually pick together the pieces. And I think we should be able to do better here. Like one motivating example is here in this little XKCD comic where, which really like resonates with me where we have a couple of geek friends. Uh, one says, I'll be honest, we physicists talk a big game about the theory of everything, but the truth is we don't really understand why ice skates work, how sand flows, or where the static charge comes from when you rub your hair with a balloon. And I was like, and this is something that really, really resonates with me partially also because I'm interested in, you know, popular sciences, pretty much like all sciences. And I'm like, wait, what? We don't know how ice skates work? Why? Why do we not know? Why don't we not know how that works? Uh, what do we know about it? What is the pieces that we don't know? And it's just like a topic. And I don't want, I don't want to ask every single question bit by bit. But I wanted to say, okay, why do we not know how ice skates work? And now please tell me everything about the topic and like present it to me in a in a arranged form that it just that I can just like read it. All right, so this is what I want to do. Um, I call this answering open-ended information needs, and in particular those that require like long complex answers. Uh, one thing I want to point out: a lot of people think I'm working on complex questions which is not the case. I'm actually not really working on questions at all, but I'm working on answers. And in particular, answers that are complex, even though the query can be actually very simple, such as why ice skates work. Um, certainly not a complex query, but the answer that is sort of like, give, does the topic justice needs to cover different facets. And there are a couple of like queries like that, such as um, why is the UK leaving Europe? I hope, or well, has left Europe. I mean, that's certainly, like a query that there is not a simple answer that really would do this justice. You need to talk about different things that kind of come together. Also other topics like uh, Zika fever, uh, which you know happened maybe like five, six years ago, it's big outbreak in South America. 
And when I just say, I heard about the Zika fever thing, now what is it? What should I, what should I know about, right? Or effects of water pollution, there's again, not a simple answer. There are like many different answers and the problem has like multiple different layers. Or, uh, you know, some of you might remember this Volkswagen diesel scandal. There was like a, a stab in the heart of every German. Um, and, you know, that was sort of like Volkswagen was sort of like the one that got really hit by the scandal. But how are other German car manufacturers like Daimler affected from, from the scandal on the whole? And it's maybe a topic that Daimler don't really want you to know much about. So uh, their website doesn't, will not really tell you very much, even like their Wikipedia page will not tell you very much, but there are certain different traces on the internet where people said things about it, uh, sometimes factual, sometimes not factual. So with all of these queries, like we want to know, we don't want to know the quick yes or no answer. We want to know if yes, then why? And if not, why not? What are the causes, what are the involvements, the controversy, the backstory? In short, like what do I need to know to understand the answer? So this is what complex answers are or should give you. So Google has a simple trick when it encounters such queries. It just re redirects you to Wikipedia because Wikipedia is designed or like the articles are designed to like give you a good overview over a topic. Um, so that's, and there's a reason why Wikipedia is like so popu popular. Um, the problem with Wikipedia that not all topics are on Wikipedia and sometimes the information is not recent enough, or sometimes there are like some curation such as, you know, Daimler might be curating the Wikipedia page and like make a point to remove things that they don't want you to talk about. So if Wikipedia doesn't have the information, then you have to turn to web search and in web search, you essentially have to manually sift through many web pages on your own, just with your hands and no further computer support. And I find this somehow like really not satisfying so I think we should just like train computers to recycle the web content, to write a comprehensive article in response to a search query. And that, that shouldn't be so hard, right? So <laughs> that was actually my, my first proposal that ever got funded was on that. And it was a three-year proposal and it has ended probably at this point uh, three or four years ago. And uh, so I wrote the next proposal to like continue working on it. So we are still kind of like working on it because the problem just isn't so super easy. But thankfully also like with the help of like neural um, advancements uh, and you know, BERT and GPT-3, I think it's actually now more feasible than when I first uh, created that slide. <clears throat> so here's how I think things should go down. Uh, the user gives me a query and that query sort of like becomes the title of an article that will be generated. And now the computer's job is to identify different predominant facts and an introduction to this topic and then provide like more details about like different facets of this queries that are relevant. Okay. Um, I think and that's like not the only way to do it, but I think it would be also really cool like on the side to produce a knowledge graph that's query specific with the idea that the human can read the text and the knowledge graph is maybe a more machine readable representation. All right. Um, and of course, you know, now with deep learning, uh, maybe the knowledge graph doesn't need to be stick figures and lines, but there can also be like some vectors and other representations going on. So this is like the cloud is just a symbolization for um, anything that's like computer readable, because maybe the user after reading this article has some follow up questions and it might be helpful to already have some, you know, to, to preserve the work and then to use it to answer follow up questions. All right. Um, so we have, especially like in the last two, two years, two, three years, there was a lot of progress on natural language generation, um, especially with respect to summarization, machine translation, dialogues, prompted generation, and like data to text. Really, really great, outstanding, fascinating work. Uh, and kind of like the piece that I always hoped someone would be working on while I'm working on some other things like information retrieval and, and, and entity stuff. Um, However, so far, most of the applications are focus, fo focusing on like formalized information needs, right? Such as question answering conversations or like short summaries. And in formalized information, the idea is that the user already knows enough about the topic to ask a rather precise information need. Um, if the user doesn't already know enough about it, then uh, it, it gets a little dicey. So, I mean, GPT-3 tried to do that by like having a prompt and then generating the article for a prompt. 
Um, I'm not including the examples here also like for copyright reasons, but I mean, you know, all of them. It's, sort of like, it's, it's kind of cute. It's really nice that it like generates some text that reads like proper English, has sort of like a narrative, but uh, often it gets like really philosophical. It seems, it sometimes actually seems to avoid giving you a concrete answer, if you know what I mean. Uh, and there's sort of like a lot of questions that you don't really know when it's just making stuff up versus when it's actually factually correct. And uh, so there's sort of like more, more questions along that line that I think uh, we need to like work on, but it's, uh, it's really fascinating technology. All right. So this is an example I was stealing from Ren Hao Yu. He wrote a survey on knowledge centric summarization. And um, he said, well, one of the problems with uh, NLG at the moment is that they just give you sort of like a majority response, such as here's an example, someone says, my skin is so dry. And well, there are like three responses. First one is mine too. The second one is, oh my God. And this is all like the typical responses that you get on most discussion forums or social media, but these are like not really interesting answers. The third one, which is of like a more knowledge centric answer would be, well then hydrate and moisturize your skin. Okay, so that's a little bit more factual, but then uh, it's still not really a complex answer. So we will, we will get there eventually. But like the, the majority response usually isn't like that good. And models like GPT-3 usually can't really distinguish between sort of like what's popular, but like not super interesting. And what is sort of like a real factual uh, knowledge containing answer. All right. So the idea here is that if you want to incorporate external information in natural long language generation, that's like, you know, particular topics, keywords, knowledge graph, fragments. Um, and of course the problem here is like, well, which information is relevant to include? And that's really the, in my mind, the essential problem of, of information retrieval to discern what is relevant for a particular information need and what other stuff is also there, which might be correct, but like not really as central or relevant to what the user asked for. Um, I first tell you a little bit about CAR, and then we'll tell you something that's a little bit more interesting. Okay, so track complex answer retrieval is a track I was organizing um, for three years between 2017 and 2019 um, with like various people, um, some of which which are UMass graduates, um, and you can find like everything about it like on on the internet. The idea is that I wanted like I wanted a benchmark through which we can actually study this complex answer retrieval. And we needed to start somewhere. And we started with like a rather simple, simple approach. Um, for example, like here, this is like the typical car setup. You're given a query, which is like an open domain topic, which we like see here, see here in the title. Um, and to make things easier to assess, <laughs> uh, we also are giving explicit query facets, which I hear like the, the headings, which means um, like here, diesel scandal affect Daimler, Daimler the company, uh, regulation versus penalties versus finance. And these three facets we want, we are looking for content to fill this. So sort of like a population task here. And um, the idea is that, well, if we have like different passages such as here, like the standard for nitrogen oxide emissions um, is among the most stringent in the world. Defeat devices are forbidden in the EU. The use of a defeat device is subject to penalty. Well, this sort of like should go here under, under regulation. Okay, and there are like other paragraphs of the like. Um, and if we can identify these passages and like chart them under these headings, we're kind of like already halfway towards giving a complex answer. However, subject to knowing what the different relevant subtopics are. Okay. Um, so we in track complex answer retrieval, we played this with passage retrieval. We also played this with entity retrieval. The idea is like that with entities, they might be maybe easier to identify. And if you, you might not, be able to identify the best text, but if you at least know which are the important concepts to mention each of these different sections, we're maybe like halfway towards better passage retrieval. That was that was just an idea, and we only ran this in one of the three years. Okay, so how would this work? Um, like the user would get, uh, or like the particip participating system would get uh, the title and one of the facets. Well, actually, they got the whole outline, but most users just like looked at one facet at a time and then composed a query out of this, did various magical ranking methods, and then produced a ranking of passages. Okay, how do we know which of these rankings are any good? Uh, there are like two major ways of doing it. 
Uh, the first one, which is called automatic, is well, we, if we derive these queries from Wikipedia pages, which is what we did at least in the first two years, um, we know which passages were in which section. And now we can say, well, whenever the passage ranking contains a, sec a paragraph that was indeed in the subsection of the original article titled Diesel Scandal Daimler, Daimler AG, then, then, we, then we know that that one is certainly correct. So it's kind of like a Wikipedia reconstruction task that we did in the first year. Um, and we can play this, we can use this here as a measure for relevance, both on this section level, like where we know both the title and one of the query facets level, but we can use the same idea to also say when the passage is relevant for the article overall. Okay. However, we can only do that with when queries are generated from Wikipedia. It doesn't work for any other collection. And in year three and part of year two, we actually used a different collection to kind of green us off Wikipedia. The second approach is like the typical track approach. Um, we create a passage ranking. We, uh, show these, we show these passages from the top K to a track judge and the track annotator has to say whether this passage should, could, um, must, should, or could be mentioned on this article or whether it's not relevant. Okay, only if it's must, should, or can, it would be considered relevant and otherwise not. And we can like use these three levels to derive different NDCG methods or any kind of like graded, we can't get like graded judgments for that. And this is something we can do for all three years of CAR. We can do both on Wiki and on textbooks where we used in textbooks, we use the query and the outline from school books, but we ask them to populate the school book outlines with Wikipedia section. So this automatic approach wouldn't really work there. So what most people think about when they hear track car is this part, this automatic one. And um, kind of like in, in this uh, publication here with, uh, with, with Dalton, Chef Dalton from like last year, we actually published like a further study on whether this automatic relevance assessment actually is any good. I mean, as a synthetic data set, why should we trust it? And it turns out that it actually really correlates extremely well with us, uh, with the system ranking that was produced by track assessors. And it turns out that track assessors have also certain kind of biases. Uh, so like whether we are using the automatic or the manual approach, we kind of get very similar performance, performances among better systems versus worse systems. Um, and the automatic ones are a little bit more predictable, let's put it this way. Uh, less problems with like, you know, lack of inter-annotator agreement and so on. All right. So that's what most people use when they say track car. And this has been like really super useful. And I think together with like uh, MS Marco, um, it really helped create a lot of like really strong neural, neural methods. Um, like here ending with like Mono and Duo Bird from Rodrigo Noguera and Jimmy Lin. Um, and I think the latest one, uh, Mono Duo Bird with Expando, they just didn't include track car as a number. So I have it, I don't have it here, but I guess it will probably work even like a tad better. Um, so that's like hugely influential and it's like really nice to see where we are and can we retrieve these passages for these concrete query facets. All right, but like you could say, wait a minute, but how about, you know, conscious information needs, you know, information needs are a little bit more vague where the user doesn't really know what they're actually asking about. Uh, that really doesn't fit with this uh, idea that we already have to give a concrete query facet. Right, like being able to say, I'm actually looking here for penalties requires really a certain familiarity with the query. If the user doesn't have that, then where would these query facets really come from? All right, so it's sort of like in violation with the original pitch of saying, well, we want like the user doesn't know anything and we require long complex answers. All right, and, and here are a couple of challenges. Like, first of all, we have usually very short queries. Um, but we need a high recall candidate set, which is, you know, two things that are like a little bit difficult. Uh, in, 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 and then we need to identify like different subtopics within this, within all passages that are relevant for this query to like identify something like the queries. If we just give out like passages in order by relevance, we kind of just like zigzag between like two topics and it's, and it's really not very much fun to read. I can say that from experience, I read a lot of these articles that are generated. So it's clearly like some cleanup that we need and also like uh, ordering of, you know, logical arguments within each of these subsections and so on. 
on the whole, what we would need is not a ranking. So we need to know what's relevant, but ultimately we, we want like a different presentation for the user. All right. So the first thing is about high recall for short queries and like the, the naive approach is, oh, just use deeper pools. But it turns out that if we don't know the section heading, if you don't know the query facet, uh, it's much, oops, it's actually much harder to get like a high recall <laughs> than if you know that. that. That's kind of like not very surprising. Um, if we go deeper in the pool, it's sort of like it gets a little bit different, but like on the whole, uh, I, it's, it's, it's kind of like even in the top, top thousand, it's impossible to get a recall better than 50%, which means there are 50% of relevant material which we're just plain missing from these articles. And these articles aren't that long. And I'm pretty sure that not half of the Wikipedia article is not important to mention. So I think uh, I think we just like need need to do a better job here. And I think part of the problem is like maybe solving a better retrieval model, right? And in particular, such as like can we detect knowledge gaps and then develop retrieval models to fill these knowledge gaps to know what what we know and know what we don't know, and then know how to ask for the things that we don't know. I think it's it's really hard. Uh, and challenging problems, but like ultimately, uh, I think that would be would be a good thing to to work on. But it has a big question mark because I might have some ideas, but I haven't. I don't have any results here yet. All right. Um, instead, um, I want to kind of like operate under the assumption that what if we had a high recall set of passages? If we knew all passages that would be relevant should go on this article, um, and we we'll want to work on. Uh, how can we identify these different subtopics? Okay, so the situation here is uh, if we had high recall passages, so like a very obvious approach is, well, first, first like retrieve the passages for the, they're relevant for the query, then determine like topical similarity between passage pairs. Once we have these topical similarity, then we can just use agglomerative clustering um, and get like a nice grouping of these subtopics out of it, right? So that's sort of, all that's sort of like an approach that's like discussed since, I don't know, since like forever. <laughs> All right, so here's like one example. Um, like here the query is about COVID-19 and like uh, mental struggles. And that would be like uh, in all these passages here, these five example passages are all relevant. Um, and if you like read carefully for with respect to answering mental struggles, you might have like two subtopics. One is about, you know, the lack of focus, you know, having a COVID brain. And the other one is just about like how to deal with loneliness, okay? The problem is, if we had a slightly different query, such as COVID-19 precautions, we might want to have a different, different set of subtopics. One could be about issues, the other one could be about measures. And these two clusterings are different, despite the fact that they would mention the same set of passages. Right? So what I want you to take away from this is that clustering it, if you want to have a relevant clustering, you need to take the query into account. It's kind of like, you know, it's, it's sort of like so obvious that I, that I hate that I actually even still have to like say it, right? So, um, and these clusterings are different. Uh, and even though we might not know these headings, even like the grouping of these clusterings, like here P3 originally was going with P1 and P2, and here we move P3 into another cluster. Okay, so how can we bring the query into, into a clustering? Uh, first, the question is like, where do we get a ground truth from that we could use for training and evaluation? Well, if we have these articles, which we have in year one, we just take these headings and say, well, every top level heading would be one cluster. And then we just know which paragraphs are in there and say, well, whenever two paragraphs are under the same heading, they should be clustered together. If two paragraphs are in two different top level set sections, then they should not be clustered together. It's very simple, must link, must not link um, uh, optimization criterion. Okay, so what we did, um, and that's sort of like based on work from Niels Ramirez about uh, sentence bird, is to actually inject some query information into this into the similarity metric. Right, the idea is that we want to have two passages being clustered in the same in the same top level section, knowing what the query is going to be like. So Niels Ramirez did, had did something rather similar. It's just like a Siamese network. You can imagine you just like learn how to classify for same and difference and use the, diff the similarity metric and clustering, which was like really good, but it didn't include the query at all. That means if you would give it the same set of passages, it would always give you the same clustering because it didn't know what the query was. 
So what we did, we kind of like just take extended the Siamese network by having a third tower coming in here, both a um, sentence bird embedded um, pieces of text further projected into like a space that captures the query relevance of topics. And at the end, we have like the same classification into same and different according to our ground truth benchmark. But the, including this query into the similarity metric actually really made a huge difference with respect to clustering, uh, clustering quality. Here a lot of work, um, like if you just use the original sentence word numbers uh, as a baseline with, with this query specific approach, even though it's like rather simple, um, we can actually get a significant improvement. And this is like on clustering. And here the evaluation measure is adjusted rent index, which is essentially uh, an F1 on concordant versus discordant passage pairs uh, adjusted for chance agreement. Um, and you see like, you know, I think uh, Hamid mentioned that I did my PhD on topic models. Topic models are completely uncorrelated with the original clustering ground truth. <laughs> yeah. Um, Neil's work was much better and we kind of like outperformed this by like at least 12%. So it's not perfect, but I think it's definitely worthwhile to look further into query specific similarity metrics rather than just taking a similarity metric that doesn't understand the query. I mean, of course, like how would you know what's relevant if you don't know what you're being asked for? All right. All right, so that's what I wanna say about clustering. Let me say a few things about entity oriented search. And you can stop me if you get bored by this, right? So the idea of entity-oriented search is we first identify which entities are relevant. Then we use these entities to actually help us find better passages. So most of what I'm going to talk in the next couple of slides is about how to find and identify relevant entities. So for those of you here that don't know what an entity is, um, actually, let me switch back here too. All right, perfect. Um, well, my working definition is everything that has an entry on Wikipedia is what I call an entity. And that includes people, places, and genes, but also proteins, events, things, anything, anything has an article. Um, if we have these entities, it's kind of like nice because on the one hand, we can draw little cute stick figures, but we also know a lot about these concepts. They are not just words anymore, but we know thing, we know different categories, which category they're in. We know which other entities they are kind of like connected to. We also have the whole full text article associated with that entity, which we can get from Wikipedia, uh, which we can index. We can either index the whole Wikipedia article or we can derive a shorter entity description by looking at the first paragraph of Wikipedia and various kinds of like anchor text that point here and more information about categories and, and in links, out links and so on. So we have two different ways to obtain an entity representation. One is more like a typical knowledge base, like pre based style knowledge base or semantic web knowledge base. And the other one is just, you just index Wikipedia, you retrieve Wikipedia pages and like every page refers to an entity. That's one easy way to obtain an entity ranking, which doesn't work so well. Okay, but we get there. All right. The other important thing is entity linking. Like if you have any piece of text, like here, diesel scandal affect Daimler, an entity linker will identify which of these terms or phrases refer to entities and will tell you which Wikipedia article that he refers to. So we know that diesel scandal refers to this thing, also called the Volkswagen emission scandal. And we know that Daimler, he refers to Daimler, the Daimler company, which is like an automobile manufacturer. Okay. All right. So entity ranking is essentially like passage ranking, just with entities. We're given a query, we're supposed to retrieve entities from a knowledge graph, preferably those that are relevant. Um, like here's an example of like, maybe if the query is diesel scandal effect Daimler, we want to know entities such as emissions tests, stock price, Volkswagen. Um, yeah, so, and, but I think the bigger goal here is to identify uh, entities, relations, passages, how they're connected as it pertains to answering the query. That's sort of like the bigger question. This is just like one way to operationalize it and evaluate it. And we are, in, in this case, we are always interested in having a high recall set of entities. It's very easy to identify the entities that we mentioned in the query, but they're often like not the really interesting ones. So it's, you can just find those with query likelihood. You don't need entity linking for those, um, right? So just to understand where I'm coming from, I'm just giving a very quick recap uh, from work uh, with uh, Jeff Dalton and James Allen in 2014. Um, 
where we took queries like this and we wanted to find relevant entities. The first step is to like entity link the query. So we identify, oh, here we have Daimler. Oh yeah, Daimler is relevant, okay. Um, but we can also do two other things. The first one is to like index Wikipedia pages or like shorter knowledge-based representations. Run the query against the search index, get a different source of relevant entities. So while entity links will only find you the entities that are explicitly mentioned, this approach has a chance for giving you also like other entities. The third approach is something as essentially pseudo relevance feedback with a twist. So we are using um, first an index of text or like passages, which we can retrieve. And then rather than creating an RM3 based on the terms in these documents that we identify, we just assume that the first top uh, documents that we identify can uh, is relevant, which might not always be the case, but let's just pretend that it is. Um, but instead of like using the terms to produce an extension to the query, uh, we represent the document as a bag of entity links and we just get an expansion of like other entities. So this set of entities that one could use for query expansion and like actually in, in this original work with Jeff, uh, we actually use these different indicators to like actually re-rank documents, which was, uh, yeah, we, I think we at the time, we really outperformed like a lot of like old benchmarks on, on Robust before. And that was like, you know, 10 years later, still a little bit proud of this. So that was something that was really, really helpful. In terms of just identifying entities that are relevant, um, uh, the, this, is also, the, this also means that we identify entities that help us because these entities help us to find better documents. It means we also found some entities that kind of make sense. Yeah. All right. So now what we did lately, we took this idea and we just applied it to Trekar and asked, can we find relevant entities also for the Trekar ground truth? Um, the numbers that we find is, uh, yeah, it's, it's not an awful approach. We also like learn that just directly retrieving from a knowledge base index doesn't really work so well. It works something, but it's actually kind of like disappointing. Uh, instead, what really works extremely well is the pseudo relevance feedback approach, just using entity links in terms of terms and just taking the expansion distribution as a ranking. All right. So what we take away from this is, well, among these three sources of information, this relevance feedback idea is actually the really strongest feature. And that's a result that we find again and again and again, looking at various different collections. And the reason is, well, entity linking the query, yeah, you can do it but it doesn't give you a lot of information. It's really sparse information. Uh, and searching in a knowledge base index helps sometimes, but you know, honestly, many Wikipedia pages may not even really mention the query. And often you have like this asymmetry. For example, um, if the query is Zika virus or Zika fever, and you might all remember the outbreak in South America. So you would think like, well, South America is something that you should mention on an article on Zika fever. Turns out, there are many interesting things to say about South America and Zika fever isn't like the most important ones. As a result, the Wikipedia page of South America doesn't even mention the Zika fever. However, if you just have a separate passage corpus, you do identify passages that talk about Zika fever and they will also mention South America. So this is why the pseudo relevance feedback idea is like really strong, especially for entities where this approach here could work. A lot of people work with that, but honestly it's not it's not the best thing you could do. The second one, the third one is like much better. All right, take that, keep that in mind. I'm gonna to talk to you about something a little bit more recent. So this is um, a work I published at SIGAYA two years ago, and it's called ENT rank, uh, where ENT stands for entity neighbors and text, which are like three kinds of information that I was using here. Um, Remember, the original goal was not just to rank entities, but to just identify how entities are connected in a relevant way. Like, what is the underlying graph and which part of the graph is relevant? So you can imagine if you have a whole knowledge graph, there are many, many edges and entities. It's, even though they might all be correct, only a handful of them are really relevant if you have a particular query. So how we identify which nodes in that knowledge graph are relevant and which connections are relevant. So here I denote with a fat arrow and with like a fat entity circle that something is relevant and the dashed line means it's not relevant. And we see the same thing that we also saw with the, with the clustering approach that 
Well, it like what is relevant depends on the query. So you might have one query where this one guy is super relevant and some of these connections are really important, but like the connections between these other entities just might not be that central. But then you have a different query and everything just like flips around where this first entity, which was super relevant over here is not relevant at all anymore. But, these, but this entity is really relevant and these two connections are kind of like rather central, right? This is sort of like the, the it, just because an entity is very popular in general doesn't mean that it's always relevant for, for a particular query. And I know that many people are looking at like popularity indicators for entities, but if you go into like some of these more interesting queries, popularity is actually not really associated with relevance at all. It only helps if you work with queries that are interested in popular opinions. All right. So the trick with ENT rank is that we built this initial graph where we have entities and connections between entities are annotated with paragraphs. Uh, I could be using relation predicates, but relation predicates actually work really bad for this for information retrieval. So instead, we just take pa paragraphs, we attach them at the edges whenever they mention both of these entities, such as here. You have diesel engines and emission scandal, and diesel engines and emission schedule are co-mentioned. So we create a new link and we attach the paragraph here. So it's essentially building up a, a rough open text knowledge graph where we take entities that are mentioned in text and the edges are associated with text that co-mentions both entities. And we use this graph to derive a whole bunch of different features. Some are like really centric, like entity centric and essentially using like all indicators that other people in entity ranking have also used. Um, and then we include some neighbor features, which assumes that, well, if one of these entities is relevant, then maybe one of the entities it's connected to is also relevant, a whole bunch of different features. And then we add in a whole bunch of different features that talk about the relevance of text, which is, you know, something we can do really well. And that's all that goes along with the pseudo relevance feedback idea where we first retrieve passages. We see which entities are co-mentioned and then uh, you say that this co-mentioned relationship is really important whenever it appears in like many, many passages that are relevant. Kind of makes sense, right? All right, so I don't wanna go into the details of this approach. It's mostly a machine learning method to learn, to do learning to rank across on a graph rather than just on individual things they can rank. Uh, the approach goes through like three phases. The first one is to build up this data graph between entities and edges that are annotated with passages from which we create a graph with feature vectors where every entity has a feature vector and every connection has a feature vector across these different pieces of information. And from this feature vector, we use this machine learning method which is crafted to give us um, weights for nodes and edges. Um, and I think ultimately this is like the, the approach is like reminiscent of a lot of um, page rank ideas. It's just that rather doing page rank on direct weights, we do page ranks on features and we just learn um, how, to, how to best page rank. <laughs> yeah. So that at the end gives us like a query specific knowledge graph where some of these entities are really highlighted as really relevant and their edges are also really relevant. All right, so here's an example produced by ENT rank. Um, on the query for Zika fever. And here we actually see South America. And this is something we're really proud of because none of the other entity ranking methods would even put South America on the map, uh, no pun intended. And again, the reason is, well, this page on South America doesn't even mention Zika. And Zika fever, the page does mention South America, but it was removed <laughs> from the knowledge base because it's a query to remove all queries from the knowledge bases. So uh, just like a knowledge graph retrieval approach wouldn't have any means of identifying this association, but we find the association through like other passages that mention these two in context of one another. All right. If we apply it to like track car for entity ranking, we do a lot better than any of these simpler methods. Part of this is, well, this is a learning to rank method. None of these here are learning to rank methods. So learning to rank would get, get you a lot, but also like the, the graph approach still gets you a lot better than like uh, ENT rank just on, on entity features. All right. You might probably ask what's up with this thing here up here, which kind of is a lot better. <laughs> okay. It's not yet published. Um, but I, I want to tell you about it um, just a little bit. And it's sort of something that I've been playing around with for a long, for a couple of years now, which is called entity aspect linking. All right, so first let me explain to you what entity aspect linking is. Okay, 
Um, I told you what entity linking is, where we take this text and we identify entities in here and which page they link to. Turns out that just linking to a page often doesn't contain a lot of information. For example, if you link to the United States of America, you still don't know whether this text refers to the United States of America in, you know, about because of its tech, uh, because of its politics, uh, because of its great universities. So it's sort of like limited semantic information that you get out of it. So the idea is like we wanted to refine these existing entity links to give us some more semantic information, which we called aspects. So every entity has a set of aspects, such as here Daimler, the company, they have like well, some aspect about history. Uh, there's also like some aspect about like bribery and corruption. Um, and the Volkswagen emission scandal also has different aspects, such as well, the consequences of the scandal, or like you know, other related scandals such as Monkey Gate and so on. So and we actually get these aspects by from Wikipedia. They are essentially sections from that Wikipedia page that we just take out. So in some ways, we are asking an entity aspect linking in this text, knowing these entities, which are the section, the top level sections of Daimler that are most relevant in this context. Right? Then here, for the diesel, in the context of the diesel scandal, Daimler is mentioned in the context of bribery and corruption and not in terms of history. But you can imagine another passage that mentions Daimler and like talks about the proud history of how the company kind of like was founded and underwent different, different changes. All right. And like with entities, these aspects we can like build, uh, we have like the full text available of these aspects. We know which entities are mentioned in here. Uh, and we have, a, we have a name, so we have a lot of additional information about it. So think of in there, there's just like more sub-entity knowledge, uh, that kind of just like we find, fine-grained, fine-grained entity information. Okay. Um, earlier last year, we kind of put out a very large collection of entity aspect linking that we use to train our entity aspect linker, but also that others can train it. Uh, I think this we have like a smaller train validation and test set and small means that there are like 5,000 aspect links each to predict, but we also have a much larger collection of the rest of Wikipedia that we also kind of like put out there. So if you're interested in that one, give it a go. Let me know how it goes. Happy to use your product at the end. The way we, we, we define it for, for training is if we, we take a passage from Wikipedia that comes from some context page, uh, this passage contains certain entity links. We might select one of these entity links to refine to an aspect link. Um, and we take the ground truth because some of these entities, entity links on Wikipedia point not just to another page, but to a section on another page. So we use that information of hyperlinks to a section to train our aspect linker. And now this section has sort of like a heading, which we call the aspect name and has like for, further content and more information about the entities. Um, so I could tell you a lot more about this, but I kind of want to move on to <laughs> how this helps us doing entity ranking. Okay, so we can essentially do the same thing that we did with EQFE, just instead of using entity links, we just use aspect. We can first entity aspect link the query, but we can also search in the aspect catalog instead of the entity catalog. Uh, and we can use the spin on relevant feedback just with aspects. Now we have aspect links and we pretend that these aspects are relevant. So we can create like a new collection of aspects and these aspects ultimately bring, bring us back to which entities are relevant. But also having aspects by themselves is a lot more useful than just having entities. Again, it's like a further refined description of what are things that I want to mention in an article that I'm trying to generate. Okay, so that's how we get the map of uh, 0.51, yeah, all right. Um, so much for entities. The last thing I want to talk about, and it's sort of like the last topic, it's just a few slides, um, is about a new evaluation metric for retrieve and generate. But you say like, uh, I want my money back. You told me, you promised me a, a talk on retrieve and generate, but so far you're just talking about retrieving and clustering and all these things which kind of like lead us there, but they're not really energy. The main problem is that we don't really have a good evaluation measure for that. So our first problem was that we needed to have a better evaluation measure to, uh, so that we can actually start working on NLG. Otherwise, we don't know what's relevant versus not. The problem with like typical IR evaluation measures is that they assume that the corpus is fixed and known. Uh, we cannot really like not use the open web because their numbers are not really comparable. And there's usually a fixed granularity of documents. 
in track car, we worked around this by just having a fixed granularity of passages and that these passages were predefined. And I think in other okay, occasions, people ex like defined a set of legal spans. So always like some definition of this is the piece that is relevant because otherwise beautiful metrics like mean average precision or like NDCG just don't really work. Now, if you try to apply it to like generated information, it's very unlikely that the same generated text will be generated twice exactly in the same way. They might just like vary with like a few minor words and these words may not matter, but maybe they do matter, but we don't really know. And, but like as a response, uh, traditional IR metrics are not really applicable to generated information. Um, the summarization community is using Rouge for a long time. Everybody knows it's not good. Everybody bitches about it and then still everybody uses it. The problem with Rouge is that it can only resolve like near duplicates, right? So if you have a, a corpus with low redundancy, and I think like Bruce and, and Mustafa, you had like this paper on expanding like passage rank, a uh, passage evaluation, which works when you have different passages that have like high redundancies. In, in track cab, you already got rid of all the redundancy separately. Uh, no, none of the participants ever saw a redundant collection because we removed the redundancy before publishing the corpus. Um, and there are, you know, like variations like bird score, for example, we actually tried bird score. <laughs> we didn't get the paper in and our bird score was published. And we actually found it works so-so, it works better, but it's still, it's still not really a satisfying approach. It's still, it's a lot of work and you have to like retrain it all the time. Um, a lot of the energy folks use close. Close is great for training. Um, but it's not really a good evaluation measure, mostly because the task is often like too easy. Like even if you use like close with, you know, some information extraction and you'd like try to predict certain facts in there, often it used like as a negative fact, you use something that's like so obviously wrong that you don't really need to understand the, the topic to tell that it's wrong. It's just already like wrong by type and so on. So this is all like, well, the problems where close is great for training, but not so much for evaluation. All right. So now the problem is we can't really study retrieve and generate systems if we can't measure progress, right? So I'm not even gonna start if I can't really show that it works. All right, so here's like our, our counter suggestion. Uh, we call this metric exam, which stands for the exam answerability metric. And we're using, and this is essentially ideas like from, they go back to like, you know, some early work at, at DARPA from 2002 using answer using like an exam question as a means of telling whether something is good. I think at the time they made some mistakes. They also really didn't have any good question answering system that we have today. So what you're suggesting is to use a high quality question answering system. And I think we have them. We are like question answering. It's not this big unsolved problem as it was like in 2002. I think we actually made a lot of progress in that direction. So use a high quality question answering system to answer exam questions using generated text. And then the more questions are answered correctly, the better the text is. It's essentially like running an exam. So, so here's sort of the setup, right? So this is, for example, here my track car benchmark. Here is the box that each participant has to fill. It's like my retrieve and generate system. Uh, in comes some queries and a corpus and out comes this generated article. All right, so the, the, the users or the generating system doesn't get to see any, any questions. This is held out from the system. It's only used during the evaluation stage, only during evaluation where our question answering system lives, only our question answering system gets to see the exam question. It's our, like, if you run an exam at school, the students have to learn without knowing the exam question. It's the same kind of setup. So the question answering system gets to see the question and has to answer these questions using this generated article. So this is not about using any best QA system. It's just also like not work that evaluates a question answering system. It's like, if you have a good question answering system and you can separately measure how good it is, you can use this one as part of the evaluation system with exam questions to say, how good is this article? Then you can see what does the question answering system answer and are these answers any good? If they're good, then this goes into the exam evaluation score. There are a couple of problems, of course, to like make sure that the question answering system works. So the exam metric that you get out at the end is just relative, it's just for relative comparison across different methods. 
different methods over here. They all have to use the same question answering system and the question answering system will make mistakes, but we assume that the, quest, that the mistakes are relatively regular. So if it will not be able to answer a certain question, then it will make the same mistakes across like all generated articles. And if like some of them, it can like actually extract the answer, that means, well, this is probably a better article than the other one where it couldn't extract it from. So what we, uh, the first question is like, where do we get this exam question from? Uh, ultimately, we think that this should be created as part of a test collection creation. Um, and we believe that it's easier for humans to produce good exam questions than to assess relevance bit by bit, where you need a lot of like training and you need to have Alan Voorhees in the room, otherwise all kinds of things go wrong. Um, in the study that we did, we used questions that came with the textbook. So the way it was working that we did track high year three is that we derived queries and subtopics from textbook questions. So we gave the query and the subtopics to user and said, hey, generate us a good article with 20 passages. Um, and secretly we held out these exam questions. So the retrieve and generate system was not allowed to use these questions. Uh, we also actually had a gold article, which allows us to evaluate with things like Rouge. Um, and the exam, our metric was using these questions to kind of see how good the article is that the user was generating. This is how well it worked. So keep in mind, so what we had here is like three completely different pieces, right? One was manual assessment based on the passages that were produced in this article. Like every, like track assessors looked at each of these passages and say, this uh, must, should, or can be mentioned, this one doesn't. Okay, that's like where we get map uh, and all the other metrics from. The next one is the gold article which we use to do a rouge evaluation of that article that comes out and ask you know, how many uh, words, bigrams, et cetera, kind of like, uh, uh, does this generated article overlap with the gold article? And the third one was using this exam question approach that only takes this article, the QA system and the exam question. So it's like three very different kinds of evaluations. It turns out that our exam metric actually correlates relatively well with the track assessors. Like I think this is here is a Spearman's rank correlation. It's a metric that goes between negative one for really bad and positive one for really good. And we land kind of like at 0.74. That's already something that's pretty good. Um, you know, say, oh, but these yeah, are better. Yeah, of course. This is sort of like how well does uh, one metric like mean average precision correlate with NDCG at 20 using both the same manual assessment by track. Of course they correlate a lot. They're designed to correlate a lot. They also like, use the same information. Exam uses a very different information that doesn't even, track assessors had nothing to do with that. Interestingly, Rouge, you know, everybody knew that Rouge was really bad. Yeah, here we see it. It's essentially uncorrelated with what the track assessors thought was good. Right. So that's how, I don't want to say, I don't want to bash Rouge, but it's a, pretty, it's a pretty useless evaluation measure if you're trying to evaluate a retrieve and generate me uh, method. So instead this year is kind of like, I think what we will be using for future and also like using as a training criteria. All right, that was it. Okay, here's my last slide. So I told you a lot of stuff. So where did we, where did we end? So we started with a uh, track car, which is where we given query and concrete query facets. And first thing people did passage ranking. And I think it like was really hugely influential and we have now really good, um, passage-based retrieval model if we knew the query facet. In year three, um, we were also given these facets, but the task was to actually generate like a whole article. And it's really like a ransom letter where we take different paragraphs from Wikipedia corpus and just like post them in a certain order. Um, so sadly, we would, <laughs> my students were the only ones that actually took the task seriously. So uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a task, it wasn't like that successful, but I think, the, the idea is right and we're gonna be working on it regardless. Um, like we've been working ever since we stopped running CAR uh, on like these topics of subtopic detection and clustering. Um, how can we find relevant entities for high recall, uh, query specific entity graphs and identifying which parts are relevant versus not so having a query relevant rating um, and linking and using entity aspects and how can we use entity aspects to help us solve our problems. Uh, and this like better evaluation metric for retrieve and generate. Of course, there are like many more questions to be solved. Sometimes things, it's maybe a quick bait title, but I think uh, 
it was still fun to talk about and I hope you thought it was like interesting to listen to as well. Um, because so ultimately we want to have these longer articles that kind of like just generated from beginning to end. Um, and we have the query, some predominant fact and introduction, and then different stories spelled out in like different subsections going along with like a small query specific knowledge graph. All right, that's it. Happy to take your questions. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for the nice presentation. Nice, nice topic. Um, so I don't see any question in the chat. Anyone, feel free to unmute yourself. Jane. Well, Laura, have you tried asking your system where the static charge comes from when you rub your hair with a balloon? I didn't. I should. <laughs> I mean, if that cartoon inspires you, I think that... Uh, if if there would be a tracker year four, it would certainly make the list. <laughs> Bruce, now I have a question. Sure. Um, your queries in this process, like in your last system diagram, they look a lot like standard trek topics. And yet you say that people can't evaluate them in the same way as standard trip topics. I guess I don't understand that because you could retrieve a bunch of, it's, it's a generated document, just another document. And why can't people give you a relevance assessment for how good that document is versus other non-generated documents? You're saying that these topic queries don't have information needs uh, or what? Well, or what? No, no, no. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, right? I mean, yes, they look like track queries, right? Um, and it's not so much about not being able to assess them. The problem is like when you use natural language generation, you will never generate the same document twice, which means you can generate it once, the judge can look at it and can say that was relevant or not so relevant. But then you want, if you, if you want to like use that information as a training data, you will then feed it back into your system, it generates a new document and you essentially need a human in the loop to assess every single document. So if you wanna use it during grade, during, during training, right, you're doing your gradient descent method, that means that every gradient descent operation, you need a human that says, this is now a good document versus not. I mean, you can say maybe for training, we can use something like close, okay. Um, the advantage of the exam metric is that we can even like use it during training. Right, it's maybe you don't. There's a question about like scalability and so on. Yeah, but, but it's, it's, all a, like it's I I understand the exam method, although I have a when you whenever you say inspired by Dottie, I shouldn't say this on the general session, but anything inspired by George Dottington, I was sort of raise an eyebrow about. But anyway, um, the. Uh, exam methods indirect. Um, and if you just want to answer the question, did you generate a good relevant document, which is what you said you were going to do, then it seems like we can answer that directly using a five point relevant scale, can comparing it to uh, documents off the web and Wikipedia. Sure, but you know- And it doesn't matter if you don't generate the same one again. It, I'm, I'm interested in if I run this 600 times or a thousand times, how well does the naturally, the generated document do versus the non-generated documents in terms of relevant mm -hmm. scales? Well, I mean, we can compare both generated and non-generated documents with that metric, right? I mean, the whole point, the, the whole problem that sort of like kept me from actually working on natural language generation is that we didn't really have a good way of evaluating the generated document with respect to relevance, right? We had a way to evaluate with respect to, do you contain the same word that some gold article contain? But well, didn't that's what I'm arguing better. about. I'm, I want to argue, I want to assess it by relevance. You ask Correct. people, this, you ask people, you give people a list of documents and say, give me a five point scale assessment mm -hmm. of this on relevance to your topic. You know, right. so that's the standard Trek thing, right? Right, so this is like what we did, what we did here. Right. Like here we had track assessors going at every paragraph in the generated documents and seeing for each of them relevant versus not relevant. It was just like a lot of work. And if you didn't participate in that track track, and if you generate like a new outline, uh, like a new set of paragraphs that we won't even look at, you first need to hire a track assessor. 
Now, if you have an, an yeah, but that's, track, that's, a criti that's a criticism you can make for every truck track that's ever been done. But, yeah. uh, it's expensive to run and it right. doesn't give you a lot of training data. That's okay. That's right. a track track, period. <laughs> Correct. Like either, I mean, if you're Microsoft or Google, that's no problem. You just like have your zoo of annotators. Keep on doing that. Um, but if you want to have a benchmark that various people can use that sort of produce like numbers that you can compare to one another for empirical research, you need to have like some metric and preferably one that's kind of like more reliant than like, for example, if you have track, uh, track annotators, they give you a different assessment than if you hire a gen, like, uh, like a graduate. Yeah, also, so I can, I can do a crowdsourced evaluation. You know, if you can, mm -hmm. I can run 10,000 queries on a crowdsourced evaluation. I want to know whether the generated document generate stuff that they consider relevant or not and how relevant right of course you can but like uh, i mean crowdsource evaluations like also have some problems i'm not saying that this is the only way in which you can evaluate this all i'm saying is that this is an alternative and we well, as long as long as you're not saying you can't do a relevance assessment then you oh. have to use these exam queries no I, I i i would never say such a thing actually what we generally recommend is that in addition to complement these exam questions to also do a manual assessment, just to make sure that this kind of correlation, what we see here is still there. So it's sort of like the equivalent to an inter-annotator agreement. You do a exam versus annotator agreement that you would certainly want to do. And you can do that with crowdsourcing. You can do that with like highly trained assessors, um, but it's just it's just like another, another means for all people to kind of have a benchmark that is reusable and not, and, and cheap and relatively cheap to put together. Well, high, I didn't think that high quality QA systems are that cheap to put together, actually. <laughs> mm, I mean, this one, it was like the one that we used um, was also like from the same people that put together this textbook collection. That was like from the TQA corpus. And I think AI2 ran a, ran a challenge on that. And as a result, like put together a QA system from the best practices that they learned from their challenge. So that was the QA system that we used here. But that system is there and it's like usable. And as long as you bring it into like multiple choice question form uh, and you have to ask questions that the questions system can answer, that was good. And that was even like a pre-neural system. So I think it, it depends a little bit of like how one conduct, conducts the exam. And I think with like different question answering system, like more modern ones, we could probably even do, do even better. Yeah, okay. I mean, but the, idea, but the idea the idea is to have like an evaluation server that has that QA system running there. It's sort of like a leaderboard, but you can sort of like automate leaderboard with this way. But yeah, so it's, 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 it's just a suggestion. And at least for like academics with like limited access to uh, assessment resources, um, it's certainly like a, it's certainly a help. Yeah, fine. I see that, it's fine. Okay. Uh, I also had a question. So the, um, the results you're presenting in these slides, um, it makes sense in the sense that, okay, we all know the about the problems that Rouge has, uh, but I personally, it, this came to surprise uh, to me, kind of, I didn't expect Rouge to perform even kind of negatively. Uh, well, I would say this is uncorrelated. Yes, co uncorrelated, a little bit negatively correlated. But so what, what are your insights into this? Is it because you only have a single re re reference text or is it because it is a long text that you are generating and Rouge is not uh, that suitable for long text? I mean, that, that, that's a great question. And we also like did something like um, sort of like bird score style um, trying to learn from. Okay, so I mean, to answer your question, I think one of the problems here is the gold articles were taken from the textbooks. The articles that were generated were mostly based on passages from Wikipedia. So now there are different language styles, like the, like the content, like if you just look at the content on like, let's say the entity level, they contain relatively the same information. You can talk about, they talk about the same topics but the style of language that's used in textbooks, especially for middle graders, is a lot about like, did you think, how about this? Did you look out of the window? Did you notice that there are like trees blooming and so on? And Wikipedia just doesn't have that style of language. And if you think about how Rouge works, it really picks up on these language clues just be 
just because uh, the, the style of language is different and the way that the, the level of detail you know, textbooks are written a little bit more simplistic and Wikipedia passages, they often get really into a lot of like technical details. So this is exactly the thing that just like throws rouge off. Like although the information is in there, it, it in some ways like it promotes like some systems just because they pick passages that have the same simplistic tone, mm -hmm. but these might not be the passages that actually contain the right information. So I think that's what rouge is susceptible both to promoting the wrong systems and to demoting the right systems. Okay. And uh, in total, that's like where you lose, this is where, sorry, where you lose all the, the benefits of Rouge. But if, if we uh, solve the problem of this reference text, text, if we generate texts that are closely related to the passages in terms of the language used, would that solve the problem of Rouge? I think you still have the problem. I mean, I think Rouge works well if you're if your documents are all like very homogeneous, like if the gold article is written in the style of what is being generated or, ma or generating material, um, but also the longer your documents get, the more it, the more difficult it gets. Like it's just like the errors are just compounding. Maybe there's like one subtopic that was missing, right? So now you whoosh doesn't know, or this is just like one subtopic that's missing. Um, if your document gets gets get long, if you have like different subtopics that need to be covered. Um, it's sort of like this is sort of like where Rouge is sort of like it's it's this like death by a million cuts um, that Rouge is like suffering from here. Okay, yeah. Thanks.